Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. Jacques Mornar at the bench vice, the jaws of which clamp the inch diameter handle of an alpenstock. Now the handle is much shorter than it used to be, a fine length now for hiding under one's trench coat. He gets the trench coat, throws it over his left arm, over the alpenstock, and walks out into a gray Mexican day. An alpenstock, for those among you who do not bother with mountain climbing and its accoutrements, is a slender axe used to chip away ice, to make footholds or handholds or whatever, and is usually very, very sharp. Tonight, my report to you on The Assassination of Leon Trotsky. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. Leon Trotsky, revolutionist, son of a farmer, was born in Russia in 1879 and died in Mexico City in 1940. He received but small education, yet he was an avid reader. When he was in his early teens, he came across a volume written by a German named Karl Marx, and immediately Leon's path was set. Before he was 20, he was arrested as a radical and sent to Siberia. In 1902, he escaped and went into exile from France to Belgium to Germany and finally to England, always preaching his doctrine of world revolution. In London, he met Nikolai Lenin, and a lasting conspiracy for evil was born. We must proclaim uncompromising hostility to all religion, said Leon Trotsky when he returned to Russia in 1905 and went about the land mouthing terror. And revolution! And there will be a night of the long knives. And the blood must flow to balance the wrong. He said in 1917, on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution, Blood must flow, and on its currents we will ride to power. For this is the start of it, and the full tide of it will cover the world. He said. And when the October Revolution was done, Trotsky became general of the Bolshevik armies and commissar of the armies and war and marine. And wrote a book. I call this volume The Defense of Terror. Why? Terror is an emotion. It is the one to which all others are sublimated. Terror transforms compassion into hatred, kindness into greed. It causes brother to turn against brother, child against parent, husband against wife. And? And, therefore, those who control the instruments of terror control human emotions. Those who control the emotions of humankind control humanity. The result of which? If this theory is projected to its consummation, those with courage to disseminate terror to every corner of the world have in their hands the power of the world. Everything was going good for Leon Trotsky, and then another power-maddened man appeared, another expert in terror, Joseph Stalin. Trotsky tangled with him, lost, and he was thrown out of Russia. First he went to Turkey, then to France, then to Scandinavia, and finally he arrived at the place that would become his tomb, Coyoacan, a suburb of Mexico City. And Natalia... Yes, Leon? Come, come, come. It is time. The rabbits are hungry. Yes, the... yes, yes. Here's the food. <laughs> they fight, they fight. Even rabbits, innocuous, gentle animals, beasts now. Foods, and they fight. Eat, eat, and be happy, for you are my empire. Leon. Yes? Tell me. We'll go back. Yes. Why each day must I tell you, Natalia, that one day we'll go back. Russia will belong to us again. This is the promise of my heart. Mr. Trotsky. Sheldon. 
Mr. Trump? Here, yeah, Sheldon. The Hutches. I wonder about Sheldon. Why? Motivations. Why? Sheldon. Uh, Sheldon, Mrs. Trotsky has been wondering about you. Oh? The word she used was... Motivations. Motivations. Still you wonder. Still, after I've told you so many times, you are a man with a cause. What is my cause, Sheldon? Terror. World revolution. It's necessary that I keep you alive. That's my motivation. That's why I'm your bodyguard. Why do you forsake riches? For you are wealthy, Sheldon. I'm told of the stature of a millionaire in your own country. Then why do you forsake these riches and come to us and live this small life of watchdog, of gunman? Excitement. But this is a peaceful life of rabbits and teas and books. Excitement. Wherever you are, Leon, promised violence. It's like there, that sleeping volcano, and we live on the edge of it. <laughs> it is truly that. Here, Sheldon, help us feed the rabbit. Flight now to meet an assassin. Hurl the imagination eastward and north across the sea and to France. Paris, France. <laughs> the sound of Paris. Darling, darling, darling. Its voice. <laughs> its charm. And I'll miss you. I'll miss you so much when you're in Mexico. But there's this day still and, and the next before you go. And there's time still. All the time there's left with the world if we just make it so. Darling, darling, darling. Sue. This day and the next. Now, how shall we start it? Sue, listen. Tell me a wonderful word, Jock. A secret and strange and wonderful word. Listen to me. Yes? You know a lot of people in Mexico City, don't you? Yes. Oh, yes. But time is spinning away and we... And in Coyoacan? One. This man, this one you told me about. Sheldon. What of him? Oh, what of him? Rich and therefore wonderful. Servile, therefore dangerous. Bodyguard to Leon Trotsky, you told me. Yes. Oh, and time spins away, Jacques. Time spins... A... Oh, darling. Darling, darling. Yes? Kirov? Who are you? I am from Paris. A letter was to have preceded me, did it? What kind of a letter? With regards a passport from here to Mexico. Come in. Your name is... Jacques Monard. Also known as Salvador Torkov, also known as Jacques van den Drescht, as Ramon del Rio Mercader. They must have sent quite a dossier on me. They did. Well? They had wisdom to send you here to Montreal first. Oh? To me, that is... I have heard your craftsmanship is exquisite. Yes, yes, it is. For example? You're impatient, aren't you? Is my passport ready? Yes. Here. Yeah. Well? Exquisite. And so my name is now Frank Jackson. Yes, the price is... They gave me $3,500. They said you would ask me for that much. If you please. Here. This envelope. Count it if you wish. No need. If I am cheated, I'll see to it you're taken. Goodbye. So Jacques Mornard became Frank Jackson. 
A journey now to Mexico and Mexico City, and there buy himself a fine car and visit the places of gaiety, and there leave the after images of... There was a cause once in the world. Now it is no more, for it has been betrayed. He would say... By a man named Stalin. He would say, and then... And this cause, lost for a small while, I hugged to my bosom. Where is this man they call Leon Trotsky? If he would have it, I'd give my strong right arm. In the bistros of Mexico... I'd give what wealth I had. A few pesos, amigo. And if it were not enough, I'd give my life. Who are you? Frank Jackson. From where are you? From Paris. And I know you. Oh? Sheldon. How did you know? You've been pointed out to me. Why? There was a girl in Paris, Sue. Oh. She said we should meet. Why? Because there was a cause once in the world. Now it is no more, for it has been betrayed. Drink with me. Amigo? Yes? There is symbolism here. Soon here in the bull ring, the blood will spill and the mob will howl. A clever symbol, Sheldon. You are a clever man. One day, perhaps, you'll meet a truly clever man. Oh? But now, the bull. Truly a clever man. I like to listen to you talk, Sheldon. One day, perhaps, you'll meet a truly clever man. Oh? Listen. Listen, amigo. Yes? How would you like to meet Leon Trotsky? It would take a clever man to arrange that. How would you like to meet him? Mr. Trotsky, I would like to present Frank Jackson. Mr. Jackson, Leon Trotsky. And for the first time, these two lives touched. They shook hands, they stepped apart, and they looked at each other. And they smiled. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. It would be a wonderful world indeed if one single check to one single charity took care of man's obligation to his fellow man for all time. And it would be wonderful too if one single pint of blood donated just once in a lifetime took care of all future needs. But the need for blood is a continuing one, as are the needs for charitable contributions of other kinds. Phone your local Red Cross or nearest hospital blood bank and donate again. The great need for blood must be met wherever it arises and whenever. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the assassination of Leon Trotsky. For those of you who have forgotten 1940, a few reminders. The Germans entered Paris ten days after the British evacuation at Dunkirk. There was an eclipse of the sun, and on July 7, at one of the most famous seances in history, there was still no word from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Senator William E. Borah died that year, and Italy invaded France. In Nevada, there was a renaissance of the tune Tippy Tippy Tin, and at a seance held in Reno... Still no word from Conan Doyle. It was the year of Murder Incorporated, and the year the Luftwaffe tried to blast England off the map. And all this, headlines in Mexico, faraway events to be discussed over tequila and salt and lemon. Nothing really to get excited about. At least not very many people. These are necessary tortures. You will see, my friend, you will see. Leon Trotsky in his garden talking to his new friend. Yes, you will see, Mr. Jackson, all this... The war, the explosions all over the world, machinations of governments which will be useful to us. The way I see it... Yes? Surely what small observations I may make are of little interest to you. Please, please continue. When this is done, the writhings and coilings of stupid men and armies, then the world will lie jaded. Then should be the time of you. Oh? The time of Leon Trotsky. My friend. Yes, you believe this true? 
Surely you know it. Yes, yes, I suppose I do. Yet I must hear it from others. From time to time, people must come to me and dedicate themselves to me and tell me such things. In Paris, there was a book I had. A book so dear, so consuming, that I had it with me always. For the times of my solitude, for the times of my disenchantment. And the book was? Your book. The Defense of Terror. Young man. Yes? About the book. Why? Why this fascination? There was a passage in it. Terror is an emotion. It is the one to which all others are sublimated. Terror transforms compassion into hatred, kindness into greed. It causes brother to turn against brother, child against parent, husband against wife. And therefore... Yes, yes, yes. And so many of us wait for your return. Yes. And one day you will return. Yes. And from a pinnacle lead the world. Uh, Natalia... Forgive me, Mr. Jackson, but my wife beckoned me from the house. And would you like to meet my wife? I want to. Come, Mel. Uh, word of caution, Mr. Jackson. Yes? Too much passion, too much zeal. The hot words of revolution in front of Mrs. Trotsky will upset her. She is of devotion to me, but she is of gentleness. Yes. Natalia, uh, Natalia, this young man is a new friend, Frank Jackson... I am honored, Mrs. Trotsky. You are welcome. Are you new in Mexico, Mr. Jackson? From Paris. And a friend of Sheldon's. I see. Leon. Yes? I'm afraid my trip to Veracruz cannot happen. What? At least not tomorrow. Our automobile cannot be repaired for three or four days, the garage has informed me, and I, I will not ride a train. Oh, that's too bad. Mrs. Well... Trotsky. Yes? I have a car. I would be honored if you permitted me to drive you to Veracruz. Surely you're not serious. Not only serious, but selfish. For if you permit me to drive you to Veracruz, you will necessarily feel some small obligation toward me, and this is what I wish. Oh? And therefore you will perhaps invite me into your household for an evening, perhaps, and then, taking a liking toward me, invite me back again and again. <laughs> and I write dialectics. <laughs> What do you think, Leon? This aggressive young man, this pushing young man, well, I like him. He has an automobile, and you wish to go to Veracruz, and he wishes to take you. I say go with him. Very well, Mr. Jackson. Thank you so very much. Of course. And that night, the thing happened. Sheldon, bodyguard Sheldon, was making his rounds, seeing that doors were locked and bolted and windows properly barred. Routine, guardian over the sleeping Leon and Mrs. Trotsky. It was about one o'clock in the morning when he passed the double oaken gate in the courtyard. Who is it? No one answered. So Sheldon walked over and opened the peephole. Oh, it's you. There were about 20 men in Mexican army uniforms, stolen uniforms. Who it was that Sheldon recognized, the leader of the men is not known. The Trotsky fortress was sprayed with machine gun fire. Leon and Natalia Trotsky threw themselves into a corner between the bed and the wall. Betrayed. Betrayed. Oh, shh. An assailant, features obscured by the dark, empties his gun into the bedding. The Trotskys were not killed. They were only impressed with the knowledge that though they had left Russia years ago, still their life was considered forfeit. And the 20 men rode away. And they came to a mesa 10 miles away and they stopped. And they threw a man upon the ground. A bound and gagged man named Sheldon. And one of the men asked the leader, What shall we do with him? Yes. Amigo. Mr. 
Mrs. Trotsky. Mr. Trotsky. Miss. Miss. Natalia. Natalia. Please. Uh, young man. Young man, go away. I've come to give you whatever help. Oh, tell him. Tell him to go. Oh. Young man. As soon as I heard. Listen. Listen to what I've done. My wife is unnerved, as you see. And the doctor said she should. Please listen. Very well. I went with the police. We traced the men to a mesa to the west. According to tracks, there were perhaps 20 of them. What of Sheldon? There was blood at a place on the mesa. Then the tracks of a single horse to a lime pit nearby, as if Sheldon were dragged to the edge of it. Now the police are searching the pit. Oh, they will find him in it. Now tell me what to do. What do you mean? What things can I do to help? Should I ride toward the mountains and try to find the men who came here last night, or... Or what? Mrs. Trotsky, shall I take her to Veracruz? This trying time, a drive there would be medication. Will she go now? After last night. I think she should. I am no physician, of course, but I should think... Natalia. Oh, I want to stay here with you. For my sake, go. Please, please go, Natalia. I'll be all right. Now that I know our enemies are close, I'll be doubly careful. Go. The doctor advised it. Yes. Yes, yes. harrowing experience. But the sunshine and change of scenery will do you good. You're very kind. Mrs. Trotsky? Yes? May I ask you a question? Yes. But a personal question. No, no, I'd rather you wouldn't. It's just that I've wondered a what a marriage must be yours to be wed to greatness. What joy there must be for you. Thank you. That wasn't too personal, was it? It pleased me. And... I must tell you this. In some small way, I know how you must feel. For a kind of ecstasy is with me these days I've been close to your husband. I must tell you, I worship greatness. And your husband... Yes, I know. Now, hush. Natalia. What? How dare you? How dare you? I, I only called you by your first name. It's an intimacy. I'm sorry. Please, I'm very sorry. Very well. Now I dare not ask you what I had planned. No. No, do not. What is it? I've written a paper, a treatise on the popular front. Yes? Prevail upon your husband. Ask him to read it. And that is what you had planned to ask me? Yes. Of course I'll ask him. Surely. A devious young man. My province is not to conjecture upon his method, just to report it. And so he took Mrs. Trotsky to Veracruz. There they saw a friend of hers off to Sweden and spent a small time shopping and drove back to Coyacan. Natalia Trotsky, after suitably greeting her husband... A treatise, he said, about the popular front. And you promised him? Refuse if you wish. It doesn't matter. No, no, I look at it. He's been kind. Tell him I look at it. And she told him. And she made an appointment for him for 5.30 the next afternoon. Then the young man procured from some source, which history does not report, an alpenstock. You remember. He needed to shorten it. So he put it in a bench vise and sawed some six inches off the handle. Now the handle is a fine length for hiding under his trench coat. And the young man walks out into a gray Mexican day. In ten minutes, he was at the heavily barricaded Trotsky home. Through a system of mirrors, he was identified and admitted. Through electrically controlled gates. Hello, Mr. Jackson. Here it is. Yes, I'm delighted that you should want me to read it. Now, will you sit down? No, I could not. Oh, why? Nerves. I am so anxious for your approval of this treatise. You will forgive my pacing. Very well. But you won't mind if I sit there at my desk. Please, please. Now, let me see. The present struggle 
has brought into being two powers in reality, and the essential struggle is to find out to think then yes, good, good. And the so and the uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Jack... Oh, well, there you are. I didn't see you standing right in back of me. This You is must a... die. Must die? Leon! Leon! Oh! Oh, no. Leon! Twenty-six hours later, on August 21st, 1940, Leon Trotsky was dead, the tine of the pickaxe in his brain. His assassin was sentenced to 20 years by a Mexican court and, still today, is a prisoner in the federal penitentiary. He lives well. He has a drawing account of almost $400 a month, the source of which has never been revealed. As a matter of fact, when he has asked anything about the crime... I had to do it. Why? They made me. Who? I can't tell you. The Russian police? Then, oh, no. Then who? I can't tell you. Now, leave me alone. He has a girlfriend who comes to visit him on weekends. And, all in all, he's a happy fellow. He's eligible for parole. Oh, I just want to tell you one more thing. May I? Go right ahead. I don't want a parole. Afraid Trotsky will be avenged? I just don't want a parole, that's all. Quick biography of an assassin. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. Leon Trotsky, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Herb Butterfield was heard as Leon Trotsky, Jack Crucian as Jacques, and Irene Tedrow as Natalia Trotsky. Featured in the cast were Melitza Milo, Barney Phillips, Edgar Barrier, and Charles Calvert. Gil Warren speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, the well-scrubbed stoops of Baltimore, Maryland. The two fellows who should have been out rooting for the home team instead got ambitious and involved. It's listed in my files as the death of a Baltimore birdie and friend. Thank you. Good night. Every day of the Army McCarthy Washington hearings, CBS Radio brings its listeners a comprehensive evening summary of the highlights of each day's sessions. Every day the hearings continue. Make CBS Radio News your headquarters that same evening for the highlights of these proceedings. The full resources of our CBS Radio Washington News Bureau have been put to work spotlighting the salient details of these evening's hearings reports. Don't miss tonight's. You hear America's favorite shows on the CBS Radio Network.